Good morning.
morning, everyone, and welcome to your neighborhood Unitarian Universalist congregation. My name is Suzanne. I'm here in our sanctuary for our first service in our space of 2022. Welcome all, and welcome, <laughs> and welcome to our friends joining us on Zoom as well. I have your announcements for the coming week. Uh, Monday nights, the Spirit Choir has returned to in-person rehearsals. If you're interested in joining the choir, please contact me Monday 7 to, actually 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, Tuesday mornings, our minister, Rev Wayne, is offering coffee talk over Zoom. All are welcome to drop in and have a chat. Uh, we continue to uh, collect sandwiches, make sandwiches to feed local hungry folks. If you have uh, time to make some individually wrapped sandwiches and drop off at MCC on Wednesdays or Thursday mornings, that's appreciated. Also Wednesday evenings, we have ongoing meditation with Rev Wayne over Zoom from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Continue to rejoice. <laughs> Next week, we will hopefully have our last Zoom-only service of 2022. And then the following week, two weeks from today, we plan to continue offering weekly multi-platform services, both in person and Zoom. We need you. We need each other. Welcome home. Calling all greeters. Are you available to welcome members and friends on a Sunday morning? If so, you can contact Luann at shiplu at gmail.com to help us out with greeting. Uh, an update on the eighth principle. Neighborhood is participating in the CUC's Widening the Circle of Concern program. This program will help us learn how to activate the eighth principle at Neighborhood. Stay tuned for more updates. C Committee, the Social Environmental Action Committee, will meet in person for the first time since the pandemic on two weeks today at our next in-person service directly following the service here in our space. Join us to catch up on what we've been doing with our social justice partners from the DMC and plans for the spring. <clears throat> Neighborhood Gallery presents Wayne Walder's Mindful Journeys in Photos and Prose. It is in the galleries above our worship space. All are welcome to check it out. You can see the art is up there on the walls above us. This week's question to the congregation, what influences the amount of time you spend serving others? This is consciously and or unconsciously applied. Ponder this topic. We hope you will be willing to share when the time comes in the service and also in our breakout rooms after service. And next Sunday, our theme is pay it forward. Service weaver will be Allison Kabayama, our minister, Reverend Wayne Walder, will be speaking, and music will pro be provided by guest musician Cassie Norton. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here to our service at the Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Congregation, whether you're here in our sanctuary or at home on Zoom. My name is Peter Marmrek, and I will be your service weaver this morning. All our services are recorded, either for YouTube or for our neighborhood website. Um, if Joys and Concerns is always edited out, and if you are on Zoom and have privacy concerns, you can turn off your camera and rename yourself. Now, we have nowhere else to go and nothing else to do. Let us be present in our hearts, our minds, and our spirits as we align and offer gratitude to each other. This is our threshold moment as we enter sacred space together. Today, to light our chalice for our first time back, I ask the president of our congregation, Alison Kabayama, to come up. As she lights the chalice, I ask you to join with Suzanne as we sing.
and to keep our hearts wide open, our opening song, our prelude today is Hearts Wide Open. Suzanne, can you tell us about it? Sure, I'd love to. This was the last project the Spirit Choir made uh, with video with help from Lauren Renzetti doing the art of the boat. It's a combination of two songs written by Leah Morris all around our capacity to love and opening our hearts to each other. Hope you enjoy.
I start by acknowledging that the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit lived in this place before we did, and together with the first, with the Métis and Inuit are living here now. We are all here under the Treaty of the Two-Row Wampum, which you can see on your respective screens. This was a treaty that was created in 1613 between the Dutch and the Anandaga, one of the nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. As you can see, the belt has two purple rows running alongside each other, representing two boats. One boat is the canoe with the Haudenosaunee way of life, laws, and people. The other is the settler's ship with their laws, religion, and people in it. The Dutch recorded this agreement on paper surrounded by three silver chains. They didn't use iron because iron would rust and break, but silver, while it can tarnish, can always be repolished and made to look like new. Both the two-row wampum and the silver covenant chain of friendship honor and affirm two nations that respect the ways of the other and will not interfere with the other. We still live under this treaty, and we wish that all peoples did so today. Good morning and welcome home. <laughs> our minister is the Reverend Wayne Walder. Our musical director is Suzanne Mazars. Z. Getchell facilitates our Sunday child and caregiver program. All of them are here in our building today. We also have Mike Kozowski doing the Zoom web hosting duties and Gordon Thorne, Jason Laprade, and Reese Rogers working the console and PTZ camera. And we are deeply grateful to all of them. By now, we are all painfully familiar with Zoom etiquette. If you have a tech question or concern, you can send a direct chat message to Gordon. We once again have a wiggle room off to the side of the sanctuary, which families with small children are welcome to use as they feel comfortable. It's not a requirement. We are open to many beliefs and learn from many traditions. If you are visiting us today, we welcome you and encourage you to stay after service. Our minister or staff can answer questions about who we are and what we do. And if you're a member of the community, you can ask them questions as well. This isn't limited to first-time visitors. Our services vary from week to week, so you're encouraged to sample several to get a sense of who we are. Next week, we will be back on Zoom, as Suzanne said. After that, we hope to have two platform services going forward indefinitely, inshallah. Our mission at Neighborhood is to empower spiritual growth and shared action for the care of the world. Our theme for March is lessons and learning. Our theme for today is serving with satisfaction. As most of you know, I've been a teacher for much of my life, giving lessons and facilitating learning. I enjoy teaching and always have. Thinking about today's service, I realized how much I've always thought about teaching as a way of serving my students. I certainly rendered unto Caesar doing those things that I was told to do in the curriculum for the most part and obeying school rules for the most part. But I always tried to serve my students. A few years ago, I was asked what the secret of good teaching is, and I was as surprised as anyone when what popped out was, let your students know you love them and everything else will work out. And then the work becomes a joy in itself. Even if some of my students never did master quadratic equation or fully understood how Shakespeare's belief in the chain of being underlies Macbeth. It is a universal truth, perhaps taught most formally in Buddhism, that we have to give up being attached to the results of what we do and just to do it. We do our service and then we let go. In the words of Rabindranath Tagore, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted 
and behold, service was joy. Now is the time to greet your neighbors. For those who are physically present, please adopt an attitude of consent and respect physical distances. After you've greeted a few neighbors, turn to the camera up there and greet those who are joining us virtually. For those online, switch to a gallery view and unmute yourselves. Suzanne will sound the ding dong when the chime end, when the time ends. <laughs> Now I invite you all to join me in reading our invocation, which will be projected on screens both here and at home. Let us cast the circle of a sacred space here. Let us cast the circle of a cherished space here, a space of safety, a place of forgiveness, a place of love. If we want the world to change, we must craft our new place and in ourselves the seeds that grow a new kind of life. A life of graciousness, of creative intelligence, a place of life and spirit for ourselves and our families. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Let's try that. <laughs> so the question has been, we've been offering that question for about two years now, and I wonder if maybe we could do it first here with those people who are in here in person, and then uh, anyone who is on our screens from Zoom can ask the question or answer that question as well. So the idea is, how do you measure out the time you offer service? And what's the lens you use, the both conscious lens and the unconscious lens that both offers you the time to do it and stops you from doing it. Hey, Fred. So I've always thought that. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I've always thought, uh, you know, being a carpenter, that my life was one of service because. I would be trying to do what people wanted. So I was, and I love, sir, I love to do service. I, you know, I'm a helpful guy generally, but um, can't breathe with this on. But what stops me is when people don't listen to what I have to say. And I tell them the best thing they should do, and they go, oh, we're going to do this. So that's what stops me. I hear you. I could hold that if you want now that I know to do it. <laughs> Anyone else? Kurt, can I come over by you? And, and uh, I'm going to come by you and, and hold this microphone, okay? I'm right next to you now. I find one of the best ways to offer is, you know, when I'm in a creative mood, just letting the art come out of me, either writing or with sound. But what turns me the other way, unfortunately, is, you know, a lot of times when people negate what I've done, it's like instantly, it's like, it's like 
you get the what you've done wrong instead of what you do right before you do wrong. Thank you. Sure helps, stops me. Yeah, Rebecca? Well, hello. Um, <laughs> I'm excited. Um, the biggest thing I offer in service is always my communication, whether that's through singing or talking. I kind of like words. Um, sorry, I'm out of breath. And the thing that often stops me is my energy. Though I seem like a limitless pot of energy always bubbling over, I often forget to give a lot of that energy to serve myself and that whole parable, you can't pour from an empty cup, that whole thing. So if the energy is running low, I, I can't do it because I can't even serve myself then. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Helen? Um, just sort of building on what Rebecca said. I like to offer, but I get tired and I don't feel well all the time physically. So I like to actually do things that are sometimes time limited because then I know there's a start and an end. And I love positive feedback. <laughs> positive feedback? Positive. Anyone else? Yeah. We've got several people. Bruce? Um, what I'm noticing is that, like as I ask the question inside, what comes forward for me is, is that I, I'm making, I, I often make a judgment about to what extent the person genuinely needs help. And if I, if I have a real sense of compassion towards them, then I'm highly motivated to help. But if they send me some signal that they don't appreciate or don't maybe need, then I start, this judgment comes up that I'm being taken advantage of and that will shut me down. Wow, we're hearing that a lot. Yeah, Chris? Um, I've learned that uh, serving is really listening to what someone is um, wanting. But I've also, what stops me is sometimes the boundaries get uh, crossed. Okay. Maybe we could have one more from our, um, from our Zoom friends. If that, is that possible? Mike, could you probably call on somebody from our Zoom connection? Does anyone else want to share from Zoom, Zoom land? land? No one there? Okay. Seems so like then maybe we could have one more here. I think I saw your hand up. Was it Deb? I'm just going to reach over, okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as a, a therapist, I'm, I, I feel like I'm serving every day. Um, but there becomes a point when I realize, and I think we all do it, is when it's more about me, like in getting my needs met as a therapist, that ends up getting in the way of really doing the, the work in a, in a way that, um, like it just switches it. And so that, um, noticing it. So I love the fact that you we can teach each other. Thank you. I've been waiting since this song was written in May of 2020 to sing it with you all. So if we could rise in spirit to sing On the Day We Are Together Again. The lyrics will appear on the uh, screen and maybe folks at home could go to gallery view as well so we can see all the people that we're together with today.
time for all of the young and young at heart to come up and close and we'll have our time for all ages. It is so nice to see you all in person again after such a long time. You'll have to bear with me for a minute as I fumble through being in a room full of people again. So our service today, our topic today is service. Serving with satisfaction. But what is service? What does it mean? I mean, here you all are, sitting in a service that several people have worked to put together and bring you. You could also get a service dog, or you could have your car or your computer serviced. You could work in the food service industry and give food to hungry people, or you could work in the service industry without food, which is a completely different job. You can also serve individual people by helping them with day-to-day -day things, like how I just picked up the bells for Suzanne. You could serve somebody court papers, or you can serve the ball in a game of tennis. The words on the sides of our police cars say, to serve and protect. It kind of seems like service can mean a whole bunch of different things. But when you look a little closer, service means that somebody is giving something to somebody. Somebody is getting something from somebody. Like the chance to hit that tennis ball, or a nice piece of pie in a restaurant. Maybe it's the feeling of community that we get after, being, after gathering together again, or a simple helping hand. In fact, service is such a common thing that I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that everybody serves at some point in their lives. Have you ever been asked for help? Yep. Have you given that help? Yep. That's service. Have you ever noticed somebody who needed help? but wasn't asking for it, and you went up and asked them if you could help. That was service. And I think this is a really interesting thing to think about because if we all serve, then maybe what we do to serve doesn't matter so much as how we choose to serve. Because as many different actions as there are to service, there are just as many attitudes to service. Think of the people who make the laws and the police who uphold them who serve with authority and with power. Think of the teachers or the computer experts who serve, hopefully, with patience and understanding. Think of the friends and the artists all around you who serve with fun and creativity. I think the important thing about service is to try and find a way to serve that you can be happy with, that you can feel satisfied with, so that you can look back on it and say, yeah, I, I did the best I could there. I wonder what that would look like for each of you. How would you be most satisfied to serve? And I'm interested to hear Wayne's thoughts on it in a minute. And if any of you have more thoughts about it, maybe you can find me after service and we can talk about it. But for now, thanks for listening. <laughs> Wait, we're child, not used to the 
we've all been cooped up for too long. Um, you know, in the last few decades, I've offered some service. I bet you have too. The building of a business, having three children, helping to build Jones School, and working with all of you to build a congregation have required great service. Even though I've grown through the service, though, it's not always been satisfying because it's hard to feel graceful in a world that makes so many demands of us. The world's not always interested in grace. And our world can be very distracting, too. There are competing needs and persuasive diversions. Gracefully offering service for the common good can feel overwhelming, exhausting, out of step with the me-focused culture. This means that I, maybe like you, don't always know how to serve gracefully with others in the world. You heard some of our, our advice to ourselves here just a minute ago. What are our limits? I'm talking about serving with grace because it describes something I've been trying to do for years. I feel that when I serve with grace, it better serves others and me too. Serving with grace, I believe, also helps us serve others again and again and again and become sustainable. There are even times when offering service gracefully has been a joy. So it'd be great to know how to do it better, right? We all would. Maybe you know John Lewis, the deceased U.S. congressman from Georgia. He's my go-to as a person who serves with grace. He was one of the original Freedom Riders and led the march in 1960 across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. I don't know if you know that one of our Unitarian ministers died on that bridge. He wasn't graceful at first, but when I met him on the steps of the U.S. Capitol when I was protesting the war in Vietnam as a young man, you could see the weavings of grace in him. As he aged, he became one of the most graceful men I have ever watched. Graceful men. And he always asked for us to serve. He called graceful service good trouble. Remember him and trying, how he, trying on how he served with grace by watching any of his interviews. Good trouble. Now, we all know that some things don't work if we're searching for grace. Serving with fear doesn't work, and it's certainly not sustainable, right? When we serve others with fear, and I've done it with my children most often, we may get what we intended, but it leaves us feeling empty. When I serve my children with fear by giving directions to keep them out of trouble, they often accept my help resentfully, and even when this service works, the fear undermines my relationship and it eats away at my joy in serving them. You can also see how ineffective fear has been in encouraging support and service for the environment. The more leaders talk about catastrophe, the more they are ignored. Fear works for a moment, but over time, fear diminishes our ability to serve. And I don't believe duty works either. I should, you should. If your eyes haven't glassed over by hearing that overused injunction, you're better than I. Sometimes you can hear it in the congregation. We should be doing this. We should be part of that. Shooting doesn't feel like grace. And it usually distances us from the act that we all want to have for the common good. Shoulds can also be filled with guilt, revealing some of our shadows. I believe fear and duty do not work, yet over the years I have felt something that does, and I bet you felt it too. I have been in rooms where people were dying, grieving, bemoaning the loss of a child, a partner, a lover, or a parent. I have been in rooms filled with the pain of parting, and in rooms of families radiant with the addition of a new child. I have been in rooms of celebration and peace, and I bet each one of you have been in those rooms too. 
Recently, I watched someone end their life by their choice in a room filled with loved ones. I assure you, even if it's hard to see, these rooms of unbearable suffering and sometimes inescapable joy are filled with grace. I'm sorry to say, though, that it's easy to overlook the presence of grace, and I'm speaking of myself. Our deep emotions of grief and joy obscure it. But if you breathe and look around, you'll feel it in these rooms. And when you feel it, the best practice for engaging grace within us is to open your heart. This might mean stopping and looking around, just be, breathe, and experience. It can mean opening your heart to grace, even though it makes you vulnerable. No one will notice your grace until everyone notices your grace. There's no need for virtue signaling or, or confusing displays of sympathy. We can let the grace of our human journey, the grace we were programmed at birth to lead us. In some ways, I can guarantee it because it's not me. It's life's way of loving us, of holding us. One of my favorite theologians is Howard Thurman. And he has this lovely quote. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that because the world needs people who come alive. And don't we want to come alive? Dr. Thurman knew that graceful service lights us up, even though it makes us vulnerable. And he always wanted people to serve, even a little, because our vulnerability connects us to each other. And when we serve, some of our finest talents come to mind and come to hand. Serving with grace might be shining your brightest light in places no one wants to see. It's not just happy-go-lucky. Serving with grace might mean that you're going to share with the world something that must be shared that nobody wants to learn. In some ways, it might be a combination of pain and pleasure, the pleasure of doing something meaningful and the pain of knowing it's going to cost you. Grace is not some applique fantasy. It's feeling and opening and allowing life's energy to come through us. You know, we can only become the people we have been waiting for if we come alive. The next time you're outside of a hospital room, the next time you see a homeless person on the street, usually a man, the next time you are at a birthday party or notice the cry from the earth, the next time you see suffering that we inflict from both near and far, can you challenge yourself? Can I challenge myself to open my heart to grace and letting it guide us? Thank you for listening. This is a unique time in our service when we invite you to share a joy or concern in your life. And I light a final candle for all those joys and concerns that remain unspoken in our hearts.
I'd like to create harmony with everyone that's here today. I'm going to teach you a three-part chant. And then once we get it going, you can choose for yourself which part you would like to sing. The words are very simple. It's open my heart, open my heart, open my heart. I'm going to teach all three parts to everyone, and then we can choose which one you'd like to sing. So the first one goes, <clears throat> open my heart, open my heart. Can we try that a couple of times together? Oh, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart. Open my heart. Open my heart. Second one kind of sits in the middle of the voice, sounds like this. Open my heart, open my heart. Let's try that. just takes a walk down and down and down more for the lower voices it sounds like this open my heart open my heart open my heart open my heart with me
you can, stay in that space and imagine that you're going to help someone. No big deal. It doesn't have to be a major thing. It could be minor. There's the service, the help, but then there's the way you offer it. So imagine that you'll give someone who's not well a cup of coffee. Can you see their eyes? you feel the cup? Is it warm or smooth or soft? Would you use both hands or one to give it? your heart as you lean over inside you toward them predicting the future who do you see yourself as the helper Who are you in this? So you lean over and you see their eyes and you feel your heart and you know who you are in this. Where is God in this or the goddess? What holds the two of you in space? And can you feel the grace? Is it in you? Around you? In them? take it from you what's the next moment it's all in the way the service is offered isn't it you said that in the question either it's done in business or it's done in love to not get them confused sometimes. And then just as importantly, then it's over.
I don't know, maybe you feel too that sometimes service gets equated with weakness and powerlessness. And grateful service can be criticized as too little and too late. And you always probably ask yourself, as I do, is grace enough? When things are going to a hell in a handbasket, is it enough to feel grace when we serve others? especially when others are needy and situations are desperate? Can we add power to grace? By p power, I mean, can we engage our ego and our intellect and our money and our effort and our willfulness and our writings and our rhetoric can we add that to the grace rather than displacing the grace? If we want to pressure elected officials for fairness, if we want friends and family to consider the environment, if we want to be inclusive of all people, even those who do not think like we think or who do not look like we look, don't we need to feel the grace and use the power to help us adjust the course? If you don't like that word power because of the way it's been used in the past, try passion. I think our world needs people of faith and goodwill to feel and act with grace and passion. It's service with another rather than service over another. But we first have to feel the grace. When I was in that hospital room I mentioned before, it was with Bruce Brackett, his family, and the medical professionals. That small hospital room had 12 people in it. I opened to the grace in the room, and the grace guided me to realize nobody knew what to do next. We're all standing there. Bruce is in the bed. Everybody's around, you know. Hospital professionals are waiting. What should they do next? Family is grieving and not knowing. There's a delicate moment when we make momentous choices. Often we don't know what to do. But Grace offered a better way. I slowly slid over to the bed, asking Bruce and Terry if I could help. Then with a nod with each of them, I suggested Bruce could offer a blessing to his loved ones with a little water. I filled a bowl and blessed him with the water, and then Bruce blessed everybody. At one point, he was passing that water around and splashing it. People were, you know, hiding out, you know. And everyone was laughing and crying. It opened everyone up. I believe we all felt the deep, quiet, affirming power of grace. Bruce finished his blessing and told the doctor to go ahead. He died in that blessing, in that grace, a most beautiful death. I'll never forget it. And Terry wanted you to know that she felt it too. In our troubled, broken, and currently violent world, it can be tempting to pull back into a defensive posture to insulate ourselves, to feel we are in helper's prison. But our calling is to be people of grace and passion, one guiding the other. To do that means we have to feel grace first and then use passion. Now, as I was writing this, two poems kept coming to mind, To Be of Use by Marge Percy and The Invitation by Oriah Mountain Dreamer. I mashed them together like a <laughs> kind of like a couple hymns, and I hoped you might read these with me. Both of them are about service, one more about grace, I think, and the other more about power. The people I love best jump into the work headfirst without dallying in the shallows and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for. 
And if you dare to dream the meeting of your heart's longing, it doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, for the adventure of being alive. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest, and who work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire put out. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. I want to know if you can get up after a night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands and crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing well has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand at the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, yes. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day, and if you can source your life from its presence. Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry. This congregation is a living entity. As Cameron pointed out to us, it's now spring when we poke our heads up through isolation and come together. Like all living things, as we reemerge, we need nurture and sustenance. If you contribute by pre-authorized withdrawals, thank you. Contributing to the life of this community affirms our life within it. I ask the greeters to come up, to take the baskets at the back, and to pass them around the congregation as Suzanne plays. If you're on Zoom, please consider making an e-transfer, writing a check, or making a recurrent gift. A link is in your chat window for you, and all you need to do is to click on it, and it will take you to the page. If you have found joy and acceptance here, if you have found a home here, if you have known kindred spirits here, then this offering is a token of gratitude from you as we work together to build the common good. Suzanne. Congregation of Neighborhood UUs, will you please rise in spirit and join me 
in singing Canadian UU Joyce Poley's hymn, One More Step. Allison up to extinguish the chalice. And please sing with Suzanne. I'd like to offer a blessing Maybe I can stand with you and find a way that you can just be close to someone. You don't have to touch them. I bless, I bless us that grace opens us up, that grace opens us with light, that grace opens to you courage for your fear, hope for despair and passion to move forward. Bless each other. Thank you. You know, for those of you who don't wish to join a breakout room, thank you for joining us. The breakout rooms might be, you could go to those rooms right over there, um, and right over there, the RE rooms, there's two of them, and you can sit in there and have a conversation for those people here. If you're on Zoom, you'll be transferred to a room that you can use, a Zoom room, that you can have a conversation about, talking about what influences the amount of time you spend serving others, consciously or unconsciously. If you're new to neighborhood, just stay in the meeting or stay right here. I'm going to stay in the front if you have any questions about the congregation or about uh, our community, please ask me. I'll be right here. Um, and then we'll be done. Often we close our service by holding hands. It's a little clumsy this first time. But maybe you could just still turn while we're concerned about COVID and say namaste and look at each other. Look in each other's eyes. Smile. Namaste. Namaste. Our service is over. Go in peace. Namaste.
Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste. Take care, everyone. Bye. Go in Take peace. Care.